Well, thank you very much, Nicholas, um, for the invitation. I feel honored uh, to, uh, to speak here in front of uh, all these uh, engaged and encouraged people. I also have to say that um, the presentations uh, of my colleagues uh, before uh, were quite encouraging. So um, I will uh, share with you what we do at uh, Puma uh, from, a, from a, let's say, global player in the, in the fashion uh, industry in terms of sustainability and also in particular on, on recyclability and recycling of uh, textiles and shoes. So I would like to start with, uh, with our mission statement and uh, we have a mission statement that says we want to be the most desirable and sustainable sports lifestyle brand in the world. So you can see from that mission statement that there's only two elements in it, sustainability and desirability. So sustainability has a very high emphasis within our mission statement. We also created a vision around that, the Puma vision, and there we are talking about four keys, which is fair, honest, positive and creative. So whenever somebody joins Puma as a, as a new staff member, we tell them that in everything they should be doing in their, in their job, um, they should ask themselves, is it fair, is it positive, is it honest, is it creative, and if it's not, then something is wrong and they should, uh, they should think twice. So. Uh, so far about the mission, uh, I think it's important to know as a company where you want to go. I mean, we heard very impressive before, sustainability integrated in the core business, sustainability even at the heart of the business model. So that's maybe even going one step further. We are not there yet, maybe also because we have a different uh, target consumer. And yeah. a different size, definitely. And, and, and slightly <laughs> different size, but, uh, but still you have to know where you want to go. Um, before you can start the journey. Then in 2010, uh, we set ourselves some ambitious sustainability targets. This is our scorecard 2015. We have set reduction targets for our own entities of water, waste, energy um, and CO2 of 25% uh, between 2010 and 2015. We set the same targets for our direct suppliers, so we don't produce anything ourselves like all the others in the industry. We have outsourced production to uh, independent supplier factories, but of course we still feel uh, responsible for the production at those supplier factories. So 25% reduction targets here as well. Of course, what's very important in our industry is the social aspect of sustainability. So since uh, over 10 years, we are auditing all of our suppliers regularly, uh, at least every two years, most of them once per year for social labor, health and safety uh, conditions and also for basic uh, environmental standards. But what, I'm, what I want to, to focus on today is two things. One uh, target here is waste reduction by design. So of course, uh, uh, waste reduction here on the, on the factory side where we also want to reduce by 25%, that's quite a challenge. Um, but that does not mean that the product in itself then has a, has a reduced waste impact also on the consumer side. So this is the element here. And then the other thing I want to talk about is here corporate environmental accounting. Uh, some of you might have heard uh, about our Puma environmental profit and loss account. And uh, I would like to as well share with you some experiences of that, uh, of that calculation that we did because it actually makes the perfect case for recycling, for closing the loop. And um, yeah, so Let's uh, talk a little bit about the environmental profit and loss account. We have asked ourselves, in, in this case our CEO then, uh, Jochen Zeitz, uh, two, three years ago, what would it cost if nature would send us a bill? What is actually the, what is actually the externalized environmental cost of our full operations? Yeah, we have internalized environmental costs. We have energy consumption, we pay en uh, electricity bills, energy bills. We have water consumption, we pay water bills. But of course, there's also a hidden cost, a hidden environmental cost to that energy consumption, to that water consumption, to waste creation. And that hidden cost is not uh, paid by us, by Puma, and also not, not by our consumers. Uh, when they purchase our product, this is uh, paid by societies, mostly in Asia, where the products are manufactured or, or where the, the raw materials are coming from. So over over five impact categories. Um, we looked at our own operations, we looked at our direct suppliers, which is here tier one, then also the suppliers of our suppliers, uh, or if they have outsourced some of their business, so this would be called a tier two. Um, we looked at raw material processing, tanneries, dye houses, 
um, uh, etc. And we looked uh, as well at the raw material stage, so all the way going down to the cotton field, to the cattle ranch uh, for leather, for example, or to the drilling of oil. And then over those impact categories, which is uh, water use, which is CO2 emissions, other air emissions, waste, and land use change, we came to those results. Um, for the year, for the business year 2010, we calculated with the help of TrueCost and PricewaterhouseCoopers an environmental damage of 145 million euros. Now, to put that in perspective, our, our profit in that year um, would have been, I mean, more than half of the profit in that year would have been eaten up if we as a company um, were to pay for that damage. Yeah, so if tomorrow, for example, the regulator would decide, uh, European Union or whoever, that uh, factories and companies actually have to pay for that externalized damage, our profitability would suffer, uh, would suffer dramatically. Uh, that, that's one element. The other element, of course, we can see here that our own operations with 6% of that damage are more or less insignificant. So no matter how many solar panels we put on our headquarters and no, no, no matter how many electric cars we have in our car fleet, that, that won't really change that picture. Okay, you can say this is already clear, but uh, still uh, it's, it's interesting to see because where most companies are, are focusing their, their, their environmental and sustainability initiatives is exactly for their own operations because this is where they have the highest impact, of course, and, and of course also where they live uh, and, and see it on, in their daily work life. But what I would like to show here is the, the impact at tier four. So actually we see that uh, 83 million or 57% of that environmental damage is caused at the, at the raw material stage. So again, uh, cotton farming, which takes a lot of water, which takes a lot of land, land that could be otherwise used for food production or land that could have been transferred from valuable ecosystems into, into then uh, cotton fields. Um, as well, the cattle ranching, where you have a lot of methane emissions from the cow, from the cows, that's, that's just how cows work. They emit a lot of methane, and methane is a very high uh, potential uh, climate uh, change agent. So um, what, does, what does that tell us? That, that tells us that, I mean, here in waste, we have only like 2% and, and, and 3 million euros stage, uh, uh, um, uh, 3 million uh, damage. So we could say, we don't care about waste, we don't care about recycling because it's kind of irrelevant. But the opposite is the case, because if we can uh, recycle our products and if we can close the loop, then we actually get rid of those big bubbles in the, in the, in the lower tier, which is the raw materials extraction, and that's the real, the real big uh, um, game changer, and, and that's why we engage here in, in closing the loop. So, what have we done? We have... Uh, uh, made an own collection, uh, the Puma InCycle collection. I have some examples here as announced. For example, this uh, bag and, and, and some others. So maybe we can, we can just pass them around for, for having a look. And, and they look like normal products, but, but we did, we did decide, design them uh, specifically under the cradle to cradle criteria. So what does that mean? Um, the cradle-to-cradle -cradle philosophy, and uh, I might be preaching here to the converted anyhow, but I, I, will, I will mention for those few who have not heard, um, uh, is, uh, is uh, telling that either you focus on a technical cycle, which means you have uh, technical materials, like polyester in our example, um, that can be recycled. So you design the product in a way that after the product uh, use phase, that polyester can be recovered. For example, by designing the product only out of polyester. So that jacket, which, which uh, the track jacket, which I passed around, is made 98% pure polyester. So only the, the zipper puller is, is metal uh, for some obvious reasons. But this makes it, of course, much easier at the end of the life cycle uh, to, to recycle that polyester. Um, and it's made out of recycled plastic bottles, by the way. So we already re uh, used here uh, recycled material um, when, when, we, when we did it. Um, the other one, the other cycle is of course the biological cycle. So for example, the shoes I'm wearing here, these are as well from this collection, they're fully biodegradable. This means all the uh, materials that went into those shoes are fully biodegradable as well. 
And after the end of the, the product life cycle, we can recollect those shoes, we can shred them and put them to an industrial composting facility, and within, uh, within six months uh, latest, they are actually gone. There's nothing left. They're eaten up by bacteria. So when somebody said, let's use insects, it's not so far off. I mean, we're using bacteria <coughs> to eat up our, our biodegradable products. So um, that is an example here as well of the track jacket. So you can see that we are using here those uh, plastic bottles. Then uh, they're granulated. There's a yarn made out of it. That yarn is dyed. We make the product. After the product life, um, the product has a special label which says, bring me back. So with this uh, label, we encourage the consumer to bring those products back into our stores. In our stores, we have uh, bins, bring me back bins. You can throw the product in that bin. And then we are working with ICO, um, which is one of the largest uh, textile recollection and sorting uh, uh, companies worldwide. Um, they then sort those products out. And uh, there's, of course, we, we take all products back, also our others and also from other uh, brands. But uh, of course, we ask them to sort them specifically this green cycle products so that we can put them into a into uh, industrial composting and also the technical cycle products so that we can make sure they are actually recycled. Like shredded, regranulated, and then in the case of polyester, unfortunately we are not able to fully close the loop yet because for polyester there are some color issues. Um, otherwise we would end up with, with only black products. That would be a bit boring. Um, but at least we can make them into pipings or into other, into other valuable products. So now, coming back to that environmental profit and loss accounting, we thought if we can calculate the environmental damage for the whole Puma activities, we can as well calculate it then for, uh, for our products. And we did the same, we used the same methodology as we did for the, for the, product, for the corporate level EPNL. And uh, we used here kind of a life cycle approach so uh, looking at all the, the life cycle stages, including consumer use phase and including uh, disposal options. And uh, we, we compared then the environmental cost, the externalized environmental cost of a conventional Puma product with then an in-cycle Puma product to find out whether they are really then more sustainable um, uh, in comparison to our conventional products. And here you can see for the shoes, that was a leather shoe, I have to admit, so it was a bit, you know, uh, um, of course, um, was a bit uh, higher, the difference. But what you can see here, you can see that the, the total environmental cost for one pair of that conventional Puma suede uh, model, which is one of our best-selling models, to that uh, biodegradable in-cycle basket, which I'm, I'm wearing today, um, that you have here a difference of approximately 30%. Yeah, so 30% less bad, I dare say, yeah, we heard today, we shouldn't be less bad, we should be good. Um, working, having worked in sustainability for 12 years now, I have to say I haven't seen a fully sustainable product yet. The only, the only fully sustainable product I know is an apple from my own apple tree. Yeah? <coughs> because there's no fertilizer, there's no artificial irrigation, there's no transport, no nothing. That's a sustainable product for me. So we talk about more sustainable product. We don't talk about sustainable products. Um, and of course, we argue with Michael Braungart about this because he doesn't <laughs> like it. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, we think we still have a way to go uh, until we can, we can talk about sustainable products. So we did the same. We did the same then uh, for a, for a t-shirt, conventional t-shirt, and then our in-cycle t-shirt out of organic cotton, and as well then with the composting at the end of life, and as well roughly one third, one third of the um, uh, environmental impact is reduced with that, with that in-cycle t-shirt. Also considering that then it is composted or, or recycled for the, for the uh, other products at the end of the life cycle. So I, I would like to close uh, with, with uh, sharing a little bit of a wider picture again. We are trying to move sustainability to the next level, at least for our, for our brand and also in, in, in cooperation partly with our industry peers. We are doing compliance audits since years. We see that it works to a certain extent, but as well, um, we have to here get the suppliers more involved. So 
um, uh, capacity building initiatives are, are necessary and we have to move here uh, to a sustainable compliance level and, and not so much to a sort of a checklist approach where somebody's running through a factory and saying, oh, fire extinguisher is hanging too low or you know, you cannot lock that, that emergency exit. That's also necessary, but that's, that will not help um, to really come to a, to a sustainable um, factory and compliance level. And then, of course, products without hazardous substances. Also, since years, since 20 years, I would say we have a restricted substances list and we monitor very closely what kind of chemicals are in our products. But we have not really monitored what kind of chemicals are used in the production of our products. So that we have learned that lesson from Greenpeace, which uh, launched the, the Greenpeace detox campaign two, three years ago. And, and here um, we looked at their arguments and we said, yes, you're right. We have to do something here as well beyond that uh, basic compliance audit. And we are, we are moving here then into uh, more sustainable products also on that chemical side. And, and then, of course, the other thing from eKPI monitoring, eKPI means environmental key performance indicator monitoring, which we as well do since years. Now we are looking, of course, at the full picture with the, with the EPNL that we have done and the product level um, EPNL. But at the end of the day, and this is really where we are as well struggling, uh, I, I must admit, as Puma, at the end of the day, with the current business model where the prices don't reflect the ecological and social reality um, of, of the situation, where the prices are somewhat too low, I would say, um, the, the more sustainable products, they're more costly. Yeah? At the end of the day, that's, that's unfortunately at the moment uh, a fact. So we have to create here either some uh, added value for the consumer so that the consumer can finance those more sustainable product activities, or we have to change the model. Or the other option is we stop doing more sustainable products. That's not an option for us, so I hope we can, we can um, use one of the other options. So, Milton Friedman once said, the business of business is business. We think business as usual is no longer an option. And with this, I would like to close and thank you for your attention.